music, and then also a little bit on the general history of music and baseball as well. And if you have any questions, feel free, free to pop them in the chat. Uh, if I see them as we're going along, I'll address them while I'm talking. Otherwise, I think we have some time at the very end uh, to address any questions that you may have. So uh, with music and baseball, uh, a lot of it coincides with the history of music and technology and what enables music to get into the ballpark. Like the very earliest performers for baseball were military bands. And we're talking here like late 1800s, early 1900s. So there was no PA systems. There was no speakers. Uh, people, when they had to do the announcements, they just had someone who was just standing on the side of the field with essentially like a giant megaphone. Uh, so once you had uh, the that sort of apparatus with the PA systems, that's what eventually is going to enable some of the different performers to come into the ballpark. So the ones that you had late 1800s, early 1900s, largely were bands. And this is also the era of John Philip Sousa uh, and marching band music was very big at that time. And John Philip Sousa was giving these massive concerts to tens of thousands of people, uh, these big sort of spectaculars. So you would have predominantly performances for opening day and then kind of scattered at various other times throughout the year. And when you think about music and baseball, you probably think about the organ. Uh, and we'll touch on the history of the organ here momentarily as well, but that's not going to come in until 1941 to 1942. And this is after a period of time where electric organs became a bit more commonplace. And the organ was really the sound of early America or early 1900s America. Uh, if you think about that time, you also don't have very reliable recording technology. Uh, so if you wanted music, you had to play it live. And the organ is one of the most emulative of all instruments, uh, particularly as they started to have what was referred to as theater organs. And theater organs have a different array of sounds than, say, a standard church organ does. Uh, it uses a lot more electronics, essentially, to get those sounds, including different percussive sounds. So a theater organ kind of comes the closest to replicating the sound of a symphony orchestra. So it has a wider array of timbres or tone colors that it can draw from. And thus it is more suitable in a wider array of different performance contexts. So it was fairly common to have like pipe organs in shopping malls, like the Wanamaker organ is one of the largest and most well-known of these organs and a big but I think it's a Macy's today in uh, Philadelphia. It was very common to have them in banks, in convention centers, in arenas, like Chicago Stadium uh, had a pretty well-known and very large uh, theater organ as well. And that's kind of when it starts to make its way into sporting events. So the organ is first gonna be played for hockey and various other events that might be held in such arenas like bicycle races and basketball and all sorts of uh, boxing, uh, all sorts of other uh, events. And then eventually it will find its way into the ballpark using those PA systems that I mentioned. So the organs that you were talking about in the arenas, they were still like pipe organs. So you had to put those thousands of pipes all over the place versus when they had the electric organ, which was developed in the 1930s, that's the one that they're gonna take into the ballpark. And that's the one they're gonna hook up to speaker systems. It's more affordable. Uh, you don't have to put all the money into having all these pipes all over the place. You also don't have to build that into the actual architecture. Uh, you don't have to build it as much into the design of the ballpark and other places. So that's when it starts to really become the characteristic sound. Uh, but that's something that's gonna change a little bit over time as well. Uh, so when we're talking about what organ music doing is doing, what baseball uh, and music does. Uh, so with a baseball game, and when you go to like a baseball game today, uh, the music is going to play an array of different roles. Uh, and first and foremost, it really helps to fill time, uh, particularly when you think about the context of almost any sporting event. Uh, but particularly like 
major American sporting events such as baseball and football, which you don't see Oregon too much in football anymore, though it was used way back when, like when you'd have like football games at Wrigley Field. They both generally have a fairly small amount of action that's actually happening on the field. Uh, I think baseball and football amounts to about the same. We actually see something that's happening. I think it's like somewhere in the neighborhood about 10 minutes or so. So there's a whole lot of dead time in sporting events and particularly in baseball. Uh, there's time between innings, there's time between pitches, there's times between pitching changes. Uh, so the music is there to really help fill that time and fill that space. Uh, and sports at its core, just like music kind of at its core is entertainment. Uh, so it all kind of plays a role in this sort of symbiotic relationship to provide this entertaining night where you go out to the ballpark. It also really helps to keep you engaged within the game. Like if there wasn't any music, you perhaps might not be quite as dedicated to like the action that's happening on the field, especially if you have an organist or uh, today it's a lot of like collaboration between like DJs and organists uh, where they many times will use a lot of interactive music. You're like charge fanfares and different like clapping songs and songs that fit within the action. Like some of the, the most famous and well-regarded baseball organists are ones that provide a little sense of music commentary. Uh, like they'll comment on players' names, on what's happening on the actual field. Uh, they might have different songs that they play for like pitching changes and home runs and things like that. So it's helping to fill that time, but it's also helping to engage you with what is happening and occurring on the field. Uh, we're also going to see music be used as part of a participatory aspect, uh, like that charge fanfare. And we're also going to see like a number of characteristic songs that really help to bring baseball fans together uh, as you have a shared interest and in that you are probably there rooting for a common team or maybe you're there for the opposition and you just like baseball. But they, uh, the people themselves can be from all sorts of different and diverse backgrounds. And when you think about singing together and one of the major places that people go to sing together is at a church. Uh, and there's been all sorts of comparisons between like baseball and religion. And you go to like the you know cathedral baseball essentially. But when you go into like a worship service, uh, it's very common to have that sort of participatory singing uh, that is really drawing you together as a community, singing together as one as you're singing this one text and maybe you're singing like different lines or maybe you're all singing the same line. And something a bit similar happens with baseball games as well. And there's different performance practices that are tied to particular teams uh, like Sweet Caroline in the eighth inning of uh, Boston Red Sox games. And then the most well-known of all these practices is take me out to the ball game. So with Take Me Out to the Ball Game uh, occurring during the seventh inning stretch, and there's all of these different rules as to when you can use music, when you can have these longer extended breaks, and how often they can occur. Uh, but with this particular song, it's pretty much a staple that is found in all the ballparks, frequently with either live organ accompaniments or sometimes canned organ accompaniments as the organ has become essentially the quintessential sound of baseball. And it is a 1908 song uh, that was out of Tin Pan Alley. And Tin Pan Alley was the songwriting industry within the United States. Uh, and this really comes about Tin Pan Alley because the US starts to enforce international copyright laws. So up to that point, like a lot of Broadway impresarios and producers would just take songs from Europe and use them because they were free. But since we started to enforce laws, uh, then we had to come up with our own songs. And Tin Pan Alley uh, refers to how all of these composers were in this one area in New York City, and they would make this sort of tinny sound with all of these different uh, pianos playing simultaneously, uh, sounding like tin pans, so tin pan alley. And the songwriters would frequently work together in pairs. In this case, we have uh, the text, usually one person's writing the text, the other one is writing the music, the lyrics, or the music being like the melody and the accompaniment. So Jack Norwalk is writing the words, uh, Albert Van Tisler uh, is writing the 
music. Uh, and allegedly they didn't actually ever go and see a baseball game that they were inspired instead by a brochure that they saw on the subway for a game at the Polo Grounds, which is where the New York baseball giants played regardless of how it actually came about. Uh, so we would write these songs and Tin Pan Alley was intended to sell sheet music. Uh, like the music industry today is selling recordings, particularly through streaming. There's like, uh, previously you would sell an actual like physical object, like a CD or an LP. At that time, those didn't exist. So they're selling sheet music. So they're creating music that people will hear and then they'll buy uh, when they, leave from wherever that they heard it heard a live performance of it and one of the primary places that they heard music was either on broadway or in a movie theater uh, in the case of take me out to the ball game it was used as an illustrated song using this device here which is called a magic lantern uh, and frequently they would use this between uh, like real changes uh in the silent theaters uh, since you didn't have like kind of automatic changing like you have today or between like different sections of a film, they would use this to help kind of fill the time as essentially like an early version of a music video. Uh, so you would have these colored slides that would go into this lantern projector. So it just has like a light that then projects through the slides and shows them on the screen. Uh, and with Take Me Out to the Ball Game, most people are not aware of uh, the verses to the song. So we all sing the chorus and very commonly with these illustrated songs in the final slide, they would have the lyrics and they would kind of prompt you to sing along uh, so that people were actually singing this song in a movie theater decades before they ever sung it in a ballpark, uh, which you know, makes more sense because you're singing about being taken to a ball game. And now we're singing about being taken to a ball game when we're at a ball game. Uh, but there's all these lyrics about this uh, baseball mad Katie Casey, who is kind of our main protagonist of the song. Uh, and then today, though, it's just reduced down to the basic chorus. And the slides were of her going and attending a game at the Polo Grounds. And I listened to just a little bit of that. And then it's getting into the chorus of the song, but to show you the kind of prompts that you get at the end. So then you would all sing the chorus. So I'll join in the chorus. And then that would help to get it kind of stuck in your head a bit more. So you'd be singing the song with everybody. You'd remember it a little bit better because you sung it and the lyrics are like prompting you to sing it like kind of like a bouncing ball essentially uh, over the lyrics. And then you'd want to go and buy the sheet music and play it in your home. And we'll just watch a little bit of this. And it was actually a very popular song for the time. Uh, sold a lot of copies of sheet music and also resulted in there being a lot of imitators. Like there was a whole kind of fad of baseball songs that came out immediately in the aftermath of taking out to the ball game. So how it gets into the ballpark, uh, some of the earliest accounts of it being used go to the early 1940s uh, and even some of the early baseball organists like Gladys Gooding, who we'll touch on later on, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, she would play Take Me Out to the Ball Game, but it doesn't become this sort of standardized practice where it's sung as part of the seventh inning stretch until we get to the middle portion of the 1970s with Harry Carey. I imagine many of you are familiar with Harry Carey and where he came from and how he helped initiate this particular practice. And it might be most associated 
least in many people's eyes with the Chicago Cubs, but he actually started this practice when he was with the Chicago White Sox. Uh, and the Chicago White Sox had another very famous and well-known organist, uh, Nancy Faust, who was her organist from 1970 until 2010, uh, and really helped set the model for the modern ballpark organist. That so she came in during a time when pre-recorded music was starting to come in and popular music was really changing to styles that didn't build themselves quite as well to the organ, or at least within many people's eyes, like a lot of growth in, in different rock genres. Uh, and she is someone who demonstrated how the organ can kind of fit within the recorded music and still be relevant in that context over the period of many decades. But she would frequently play Take Me Out to the Ball Game as part of White Sox games. Uh, and Harry Carey would just kind of stand in his booth and sing along to it. And Bill Veck, uh, who was the person who owned the White Sox at the time, and was a consummate promoter of baseball games. And he did all sorts of different gimmicks that you can go and look up uh, to try to draw people into the ballpark. He noticed uh, Harry Carey singing along, and there's various different stories as to how this eventually came to be. He wanted to convince Harry Carey to sing along, and Harry Carey was embarrassed. He didn't want people to like laugh at his poor singing voice, but then like one one legend is that uh, Bill Veck had a recording of him singing. And he said he was going to play it anyway, so he might as well sing it live because he's going to play it on the cassette. Uh, regardless of how it kind of came about, uh, it's really the quality and scare quotes of Harry Carey's singing voice that perhaps made it be really ingrained as this ballpark practice. And Skip Cher Carey, who is Harry Carey's son and a broadcaster as well has that quote there about how he felt that it was successful because he had a bad voice and the fans really had nothing to lose by singing along also as they perhaps couldn't have done it any worse. Uh, and he would also like when he would sing uh, this particular song weeks with the White Sox, he would frequently mention Nancy Faust by name as well. And that helped provide her with some notoriety. Uh, and let people know because you have this organ that's kind of off somewhere and you have kind of no idea where this sound might actually be coming from. There's sort of this disembodiment that is coming down and being opposed upon you. Uh, so listen to a little bit here. So I'll actually say, you no, know, hey, Nancy, at the very beginning before he then goes into the practice. Hi. And there we also have like the scoreboard prompting them to sing along also. And the scoreboard is another element that is encouraging greater interaction and engagement within uh, the course of a baseball game. So eventually then Harry Carey, he'll go over to the Chicago Cubs. And this is when we're really going to see the practice be a bit more widespread uh, because the Chicago Cubs you know, ended up having fans throughout the United States uh, because they are on WGN, you know, WGN Superstation. Uh, they also were like the only ones that were still doing day games uh, and they would frequently still show the seventh inning stretch. Uh, so you would actually see Harry Carey singing. When you see a lot of games today, they kind of just cut out and have that be an extended uh, commercial break. But that is what's really going to help ingrain that particular practice. And we'll have other teams that have their own specific practices. Some of them insert them within the seventh inning. Other ones, we'll put them at the various different spots, like I mentioned with the, the Boston Red Sox and Sweet Caroline. So having that participatory element, uh, having the community being really fostered through games is going to be you know, another key aspect of music, of ballpark music. Uh, and we're going to see ballpark music also used as a source of identity as well as branding. Uh, and this is especially the case with the walk-up music that players use today. And if you remember the movie Major League, it was pretty old at this point, but like Wild Thing that was being used when like their main reliever, uh, Ricky Vaughn was being brought in. Uh, that 
kind of was part of this move towards having that kind of walk-up music. Like you also have like walk-up music for professional wrestlers and in various other contexts. And it becomes a source of branding and identity for a lot of the baseball players. They might use songs that tie into their musical tastes, uh, where they're from. Like if you're you know, a Puerto Rican baseball player, maybe you'd use some like regional reggaeton. If you're from like a rural, uh, town in Alabama, maybe it's a country song or something like that. Uh, and they will frequently be the ones that actually pick uh, their specific music. And because of the prevalence of this walk-up music, that's part of the reason why Wrigley Field actually got a little bit of a facelift as far as its sound system, because the organist was actually originally, uh, Gary Pressey used to be the Cubs organist. He originally was providing a lot of this walk-up music. Uh, in part because the system at Wrigley Field sounded so bad. Uh, so eventually they updated it and then players got to pick their own individual songs. Uh, as for the opposing players, we will actually see in many cases that being provided by the organist. Uh, Nancy Faust used to do that. Uh, and I'll look at a couple other examples later on if we have time of uh, other organists and what they do. And then the ceremonial aspects, like particularly uh, patriotic types of songs, like, uh, the Star Spangled Banner, which you know initiates pretty much all major American sporting events, but that's not really something that becomes super ingrained until we get to the Vietnam War. So this pops up quite a bit during times of war. Uh, so it would be used for a lot of the, like the opening day ceremonies, but as far as being used in the context of a baseball game, like there's an example, is either like the 1917-1918 World Series uh, between the Cubs and the Red Sox where they actually played it during the seventh inning stretch. Uh, it also pops up again uh, after World War II and many uh, clubs will use it then, but then they eventually stop using it. And really Vietnam, that's gonna be the, the marker when it becomes like really ingrained and doesn't go away. But then we also see other sorts of patriotic songs like God Bless America, uh, especially in the aftermath or in like commemoration of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, and like the Yankees in particular are gonna be the ones that are gonna use that with most frequency. So the types of music, and I've touched on most of these here already uh, that you might find at a ballpark. And this is in addition to all the sounds that are occurring on the field, which will then make up the entire soundscape of a baseball game. You have the live groups like the military bands that I mentioned, and then you also have some groups that will perform live within the stands, uh, like the Cubs Dixieland band that you see on the left-hand side there. The Dodgers have a somewhat similar uh, type of band, and we'll talk about that later as well, that would perform from the stands. The live organ music, and then the canned recorded music, and particularly these two, are gonna be the ones that are going to see differing degrees of balance as we go through the history of music as part of baseball games. So I mentioned the kind of early performances with live groups and Wrigley Field is the stadium where we're going to see the initial performances of baseball organists. And before this, we had had organs in other realms like Madison Square Garden, other sporting events. Madison Square Garden, uh, Chicago Stadium uh, are going to use uh, organs, have big pipe organs at that point. And the first time that we see it in a baseball game is in 1941. It was for a two game set uh, being performed by an organist named either Roy or Ray Nelson, depending upon which account you're going off of. He played before the games. He had to stop before the broadcast started because he was playing these songs that were restricted. Uh, essentially, the Cubs would have to pay some additional copyrights and things like that. Uh, and that's why he stopped. But he said he would have like new and different songs after the Cubs came back from their road trip uh, that they went on immediately after these two games. But when they came back, then the organ was gone. Uh, and then with the Cubs, they're probably the ones that might be most tied to organ music today, but they're not going to use an organ again until almost every other ballpark had one. So they're not going to go back to the organ until the late 1960s. Uh, so the, the ballpark that really entrenches the organ is Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and the organ there, and this is like adding to 
a rather cacophonous environment within Brooklyn uh, and performed at their baseball games. But the organist there was Gladys Gooding. Uh, and Gladys Gooding was the organist from 1942 until they left, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers left for LA after the 1957 series. And she is someone who like grew up in Missouri, Illinois, and kind of around the, the border region and came over into New York City essentially to make it as a musician. And like a lot of the early ballpark organists, she was a theater organist. And that theater organ that I mentioned has that wider array of different sounds that it can use. Like if you've ever heard the term like pulling out all the stops, like all the stops that kind of, all these like little knobs and nodules on the organ that determine which pipes are being used. And different pipes have air that go through them at different speeds and are of different length. So they create a variety of different sounds. Uh, so she would perform for silent films and the organ becomes the quintessential sound of silent films also because you only have to pay one organist instead of dozens of musicians. And plus one organist can just improvise a whole lot more. Uh, they can adapt their music to what's happening on the screen about a bit more easily. And that's kind of what an organist is doing in baseball, especially when they were the only music that was being played. They are constantly adapting and they are constantly changing things around depending on what's happening on the field and what sort of action is occurring. So she would perform as a theater organist. Uh, and then eventually she was working at Madison Square Garden. So she was performing like for uh, New York Rangers games uh, and touring, like uh, playing as a touring musician and kept you know, soliciting the Dodgers to add in an organ and eventually they do in 1942. And this is adding to an environment that was already quite lively. So you have this group that was called the Dodgers Symphony, uh, and they were the unofficial house band for the Brooklyn Dodgers, initially sneaking their music, their instruments into the ballpark. Uh, they were not, you know, sanctioned by the team, though eventually the team kind of gave up and just gave them a spot by the dugout and they could play, you know, these different kind of satirical types of songs and poke fun at the players, even more so than say what um, Gladys Gooding could do. Like Gladys Gooding one time played Three Blind Mice and got in trouble with the umpires for doing that, but the Dodgers Symphony could do that because they're not being employed by the team. So uh, they were already established. Uh, there was like a tin whistle player that would play in the stands. There was also their cowbell yielding number one fan, Hilda Chester. So she's already inserting herself which mean, within a pretty lively atmosphere. And initially the use of music is gonna be quite limited. So long sort of breaks in the action before and after the game, extended breaks in between inning breaks. But then eventually over time, we'll see the organ start to insert itself more and more within the context of baseball games. And the organs that they're using within the ballpark. Uh, so these are more like the Hammond organs, the electronic organs. Uh, and Hammond organ is kind of used as like a generic name many times for an electric organ, uh, but it's a specific brand of organ. Lawrence Hammond uh, came up with it and he was actually a watchmaker. Uh, and he noticed that his motors were making these sounds when they were spinning around and he solicited the help of his more musically inclined friend to come up with this particular instrument. Uh, called the Hammond organ. So the Hammond organ have what's referred to as these tone wheels that spin and that determines like how the little notches are on the wheel as well as how fast they're spinning is determining the pitches that they're creating. And these are more the types of organs that we're going to see uh, people like Gladys Gooding actually performing, oops, performing within the ballpark, which you can see there. So it's not like the whole kind of massive console of a pipe organ. It doesn't require the use of all those pipes being put in all over the place, the infrastructure that that requires there and being built into the architecture. She's able to use that speaker system that is already installed within the ballpark uh, and have that be used to spread the music throughout. And she is someone who would very commonly comment on the action. Uh, and this will be in contrast to another organist that we'll look at here momentarily. Uh, and I put there a couple of different compositions that she used, songs that she used. Uh, and these would all be 
you know, reasonably well-known songs uh, and largely like Tin Pan Alley sorts of songs. Uh, some of them a bit more participatory, like uh, this uh, Chukaneka's uh, kind of called like the Mexican clapping song. Uh, that's one that would elicit some sort of participation, but frequently playing off the team name, like St. Louis Blues for the Cardinals, Yankee Doodle Boy for the Yankees. Uh, ones that get at the mood of what is occurring, uh, particularly the whole like list of songs that she played when the Dodgers were about to leave and playing their final game in Brooklyn. Like, don't ask me why I'm leaving. If I had my way after you're gone, uh, finishing with all anxiety at the very end. So creating a very sort of somber atmosphere. And she would also play take me out to the ball game. Uh, so one of the earliest accounts of an organist playing that particular song, but not in any sort of like formalized way that would happen at the exact same time. And she also produced two of these series of V discs. Uh, and these were sent out to military personnel. Uh, like on one of her V discs, the other side of it is uh, uh, who's on first, the Abbott and Costello routine. Uh, so she produced one that's just called like organ mood music. Uh, and then for this one, uh, this is more particularly baseball music. And she gives like a little introduction Hello. by herself this at the beginning. Exciting. For the past several years, I have been playing at Madison Square Garden for all sports events and at Ebbets Field for our beloved bums, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Special Services has arranged to bring you your favorite tunes on v -Disc. So eventually we'll start to see a lot more stadiums, particularly after the success of the organ at Ebbets Field, uh, see them uh, adopt an organist, employ an organist, and another very famous early one. Uh, and though the organ is not always going to be popular with all the fans, uh, particularly you think about a lot of stadiums today, uh, like you know, aside from Wrigley Field, they are frequently off in like suburban areas where they can put in all of these uh, parking garages and shopping malls and things like that. And uh, within Ebbets Field, so it's just like right in the downtown. And there was one neighbor uh, a few blocks away, a retired music teacher who said that the organ music was interrupting his afternoon naps and took the Dodgers to court over this. Uh, so there was like some controversy if, if an organ should be in the ballpark or not, uh, particularly by some others who felt like the organ had these sacred associations and it shouldn't be like denigrated in scare quotes uh, by being used within a ballpark. In the case of this particular individual, so he took them to court and it became pretty evident to the judge that he couldn't even hear really, that he was pretty hard of hearing. So it's quite unlikely that the organ was even interrupting his naps uh, and the case was dismissed. Uh, but uh, some of the other organists that we're going to see, so it pops up all over the place. Uh, and John Kiley is another well-regarded and well-known early organist. Uh, and he performed for all the Boston teams. And whenever people have trivia, like who played for like, and they'll name like a baseball, uh, basketball and hockey team, it's usually an organist that has done that. So the Boston Braves, now the Atlanta Braves, when they uh, originally became up there in Boston, he would play for them, uh, play for the Red Sox for four decades. Bruins and Celtics as well and here you see him playing for the Bruins and he is someone who also was working in other avenues as an organist he was particularly working in uh, radio uh, and radio is another big place for organ uh, particularly providing kind of mood music to different sorts of radio dramas and radio stories that would be happening but he is someone who kind of takes the almost opposite approach to Gladys Gooding, where he says that he doesn't want uh, participation at Fenway uh, and that he just tries to make it a pleasant evening uh, and that he doesn't want interactive music because uh, those 
uh, organists he thinks are just being like old time theater organists that you want to play things that people can hum nostalgia and that's something that people really mention with the organ generally as being fairly nostalgic of baseball games and that there's only a minute between innings so a prize to play like fast uh, bright uplifting stuff and over time the organ is going to be a bit more constrained as to how much time it has uh, like Nancy Faust used to look at the ringtone charts uh, back when it was big to have ringtones and pay for ringtones uh, because those would be like 30 second snippets of music uh, and that might be all the time that she has so she frequently would like look at those and then adapt those sorts of music so he is kind of one of the right right lines there about he only has kind of a small kind of constraint uh, amount of time to really play. Uh, but he also states here that he tries to play stuff that's appropriate to baseball, or at least what he thinks is appropriate to baseball. Uh, so 40 show tunes, a 50, 60s, that you can't play those dreary rock things. Most of them are sad about drugs and stuff like that. And that's not in keeping with the baseball game. And those sorts of attitudes are part of why there's going to be a little bit of a decrease or decline in organ music as we get to the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, as the organists are not adapting to the musical atmosphere because you know people like John Kiley and many others feel like it's not really well suited to a baseball game or it's not well suited to being played on the organ and different stadiums are putting in these large interactive video boards they're improving their sound systems uh, and particularly for like there's different mascots that start to come about during this time and the kgb chicken who's known today as the san diego chicken he's kind of the first amongst these that you'd be have all these different antics that were accompanied by uh, rock music and like the harder sounds of music uh, so the ballparks are trying to adapt. The organists aren't really kind of coming along with this or in many cases, like today, if you go to a baseball game, it's kind of a bit of a balancing act where you're going to have a lot of contemporary popular music to draw to one sort of audience, but then it'll be balanced with a little bit of organ music that provides a bit more of that nostalgic pull uh, that a lot of, of your kind of traditional baseball fans might want to hear a bit more of. And Nancy Faust, as I've mentioned her a couple of times already, she is going to be really key, or has been really key in sustaining uh, the organ and being someone who is very visible and very accessible. And a lot of organists today maintain some of this accessibility of Nancy Faust through electronic means. But Nancy Faust, like if you went to games at Old Comiskey or New Comiskey slash US Cellular Field or whatever it's called today, uh, she was someone, like initially she was placed out within the stands at Old Comiskey. So you would see Nancy and she's like a real person and you could interact with her. You could make requests with her. Uh, and she was, you know, very open with her time and like chatting with fans and, and had like a rapport with people. Uh, so she kind of ingrained herself a little bit more and was a bit more adaptable. And when she was hired for the White Sox, she was still, I believe, a teenager when she started. Uh, so she was a little bit more in tuned uh, with contemporary popular music. Uh, she was a little bit of like a keyboard prodigy uh, and as someone who could play anything by ear and playing by ear is particularly important for like contemporary organists uh, if they're trying to pick up like snippets of current popular music. And many times they might get a request and have to like work it out really fast and then go over and play it on the organ. You're not gonna find, you know, sheet music to Ariana Grande or something like that. So playing by ear is going to be very, very, and she had a phenomenal ear, is going to be very key with her particular success. And she, uh, even when they moved to New Comiskey, it was still U.S. Sailor Park when she, or Field, when she retired. Uh, they put her in a booth uh, that was behind home plates but she always kept the door open and she encouraged people to come in and see her there. And you can see her like signing an autograph there and having like all these photos of different fans and people like that. So she still maintained that accessibility. And she is someone who follows a bit more in the mold of what Gladys Gooding did, where she provides like these musical puns and a sense of commentary on the action that's occurring on the field. Uh, and especially well-known 
uh, for taking off for the ball game, but also the song uh, Na Na Hey Hey, uh, which was used when opposing pitchers were being taken out of the game, particularly after a home run uh, was given up. And I can move this out of the way. Uh, and we're going to see it even be, it actually helps with the song recharting. Uh, she actually gained like success or she had led to some of the success of this particular song. Uh, and she, it took a couple of times for this really to take root with the fans. And there at the end, you actually see a little bit of the, so Bill Vec being the owner at the time and the promoter, what they referred to as the exploding scoreboard. Uh, so you would see, and this is kind of almost a precursor to the giant video boards that you'll see at baseball games today. So we have more and more of these components finding their way into the ballpark. We're also having a lot of, of uh, differing approaches in ballpark construction. So ballparks, like Wrigley Field and Fenway Park. These are your classic like uh, diamond box, uh, jewel box stadiums. And over time, particularly with more like move to suburban aspects of uh, places and new like multi-use facilities uh, where they might not just be for baseball games, but for, uh, for football or you know, any other sort of sport, they become these kind of nondescript, uh, they kind of like kind of concrete donuts. Uh, so not anything like really remarkable about them. Uh, and this trend is going to shift a bit. So the use of the organ is continuing to decline. We're seeing more and more contemporary popular music, more of these giant video boards. The Dodgers are going to be another one that puts in one of the earliest of these big uh, video boards. But then we get in the early 1990s, uh, we start to see this trend of retro stadiums come in. Camden Yards is the first of these. Uh, and there's also polls like uh, for retro elements in general, like throwback nights, uh, like retro jer jerseys start to become popular around this time. So these ballparks that evoke elements of past ballpark architecture, like you would see with Wrigley Field and Fenway Park and Old Comiskey and parks like that, uh, but have modern amenities. So they have, you know, all of the, you know, nice uh, restaurants and restrooms that aren't disgusting and open concourses and don't have like sight lines with like giant poles that are in the way uh, and also have luxury boxes, uh, which is something that drives a lot of revenue for baseball games. So Camden Yard is kind of the first of these. It doesn't use an organ, but these other places that start to come in the aftermath of of, can, of this whole like move and retro stadium construction, they do start to reincorporate organists. And many of them had gotten rid of their organists and they have these stadiums that look like the stadiums of old, uh, the ballparks of old. So they're gonna try to evoke the sound of the old ballparks as well. And that will lead to a resurgence of the ballpark organists, but we're continuously seeing more and more of this popular music come in. So the organist has to construct this sort of space uh, within the context of a baseball game. And a lot of them have taken to using social media. And Matthew Kaminsky has been the Braves organist, I think for about 14 or 15 years. And he was the first, and now he's like the organist for almost every baseball team in, in uh, Georgia, like he plays for the University of Georgia and all these other places. But he is one of the first of these that uses Twitter. Uh, and then eventually I'll spread it out to other social media. So this is his page as of you know, a couple hours ago. And this is just from a couple of days ago they posted this. Like he actually solicits people's selections, uh, what they would like to hear at the baseball game. Uh, and then even like people when they're watching at home, it makes them feel like they're part of the 
part of the game when they hear that their song has been selected or even somebody within the stands hearing that. And one of his major roles is to provide that walk-up music for the opposing team batters like Nancy Faust would do that also. And he is also in the vein of like Nancy Faust of the, the musical puns. So he'll ask and solicit selections. And he used to be that he was perched because the Braves got rid of their organ. They brought the organ back. He was perched up at the top of the press box uh, and he would have like a, his keyboard set up there. I think he has a more like permanent spot now in the newer park that they play in. But he would get these selections that come in through Twitter. He might not be familiar with them. So he'd sit down and kind of listen to them for a second. And that's where that playing by ear really comes into effect. And then performs the piece. And now he gets a lot of his selections well in advance uh, because he has a pretty strong following. And he's also been you know, key in, and there's a bunch of other organists that are on social media as well. You can find almost any of them. You can find them on TikTok. You can find them you know, all over the place. Josh Cantor of the Red Sox is another kind of key one. Uh, and they're really gonna help with a lot of the organists getting involved in this particular way. So like Nancy Faust, it makes them accessible, but in this case, digitally accessible because they're still off in their booths. Though there are some ballparks that do put the organists down the stands, like Target Field in Minneapolis. Uh, Sue Nelson, who's their organist, was like placed right by, I think, like a restaurant, and you could like see her there and, and walk by. So, at the very least, they have this sort of digital accessibility, but they're still like fighting for like sonic space with all of the different like DJs and popular music that are coming in. So, that's kind of an overview of ballpark music, stadium music. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a couple of questions for you, Matt. Um, sure. Do you have a favorite park that you uh, think is doing particularly cool things uh, in this in this realm? Like um, anyone who's got particularly interesting music choices going on, or um, something interesting happening with their organ or their uh their main musician anyone you want to kind of highlight who's doing it who's really doing it right right now sure um i mean i haven't been to too many baseball games lately but like josh Cantor at the red sox he does a, a really good job and he, i think his day job is like working as a harvard librarian uh mm -hmm. and he's the one who also gets a lot of these selections uh matthew kaminsky that i mentioned is another one because he's incorporating uh, a lot of people's feedback. Uh, there's a guy in San Diego whose name I'm blanking on right now. Uh, Bobby Freeman, I think is his name. He's another one. And they actually have him sometimes out in the stands as well. And a lot of the organists today, I think they do a pretty good job of adapting their selections and doing pretty interesting renditions of, uh, Dieter Rule is another one too. And he plays mm -hmm. for all the LA teams, the King. He started off as the Kings organist and now has since, since their organist has retired has since been working with the Dodgers also. But they all do a pretty good job of melding their selections and really catering them to contemporary crowds. Great. Um, yeah, any questions uh, from our audience? Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you to our audience as well. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so we're gonna throw it up. Uh, we're gonna make it available to anybody who missed out or anyone who would like uh, to use it as a reference uh, to go back and see those great recordings that you shared with us. Um, and just as one last reminder to everybody, our next Brookfield Reads event will be taking place on Thursday, July 28th, and that will be Baseball in the Wild West. Matthew, thank you again so much. This was really, really fascinating. I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Thank you for having me. Great. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.